Today's talk, um, titled Warfare, Property Law, Colonial Continuities, is by Brenna Bander, who is an Associate Professor at Allard School of Law, University of British Columbia, and was previously a reader in Law and Critical Theory at SOAS, University of London. Brenna's transdisciplinary work encompasses critical theories of race, gender, and colonialism, as well as property law. In her book from 2018, uh, The Colonial Lives of Property, published by Duke University Press, she develops the idea that modern processes of racialization and modern laws of property share conceptual logics and are articulated in conjunction with one another. The violence of abstraction that transformed land into a commodity over the course of a long capitalist transition has a counterpart in racial thinking that figured entire populations in a hierarchy of value. The book's exploration of racial regimes of ownership in specific contexts, including 17th century Ireland, 19th century Australia, and 20th century Palestine, is a fascinating work of not only critical legal theory, but also develops highly sophisticated theorizations of race, class, and colonialism. Through a critique of the ideology of improvements, as well as an exploration of the links between modern notions of individuality and property, and the book offers compelling new challenges to our dominant political imaginaries today. In the book Revolutionary Feminisms, uh, recently published by Verso Books, uh, Brenna and her co-editor Rafif Ziade bring together leading scholars to discuss feminist ge genealogies and reconsider them from the present conjuncture. In their introductory essay to the volume, they go against the academic obsession with novelty and newness to instead explore, as they write, the collective memory and histories of struggle that shape the very possibilities of radical change in our present and near future. Brenna is also co-editor with uh, Jonathan Goldberg-Hiller of a collection of academic essays concerned with the work of Catherine Malibu, and she's co-editor with Alberto Toscano of a forthcoming volume of essays from Verso um, uh, by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Uh, that's called Abolition Geography, will be published in May, and it's one that many of us are eagerly looking forward to. So we're honored to have uh, Brenna here today for the talk. She's proposed um, looking at the conceptual and historical analogies between warfare and laws of private property. Um, I'm really keen to get started and hand you over to Brenna, but just briefly before we begin to let you know that we're gonna have a break um, from this series in April, but we'll be back in May with um, a hybrid event, an on-site event at ULUP that will be streams. Uh, by our friend and colleague from the American University of Paris, Professor Jeff Gilbert who will give a talk titled Crisis for Real, which turns to questions of representation and considers the shared problems of, uh, excuse me, the shared problems that literary realism and economics have in imagining the real conditions of individual and social action in times of crisis. So that's uh, May 25th, and I'll share more info about, about that with you shortly. Okay, so for today's talk, um, just a reminder that you'll also have uh, an opportunity to post questions at the end. So please um, feel free to make use of the, the question box and we'll go through as many as we can after the talk. So it's my pleasure to hand you over to uh, Brenna Bander. Thanks, Eugene. Um, thanks, Eugene, for this invitation. And also uh, thanks, Eugene, for your patience because we had to postpone um, several times. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen in a moment, but I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that I'm speaking from the unceded and traditional lands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. To say that land is unceded means that these nations were not conquered by a foreign power in war. It means that they did not give up their lands through treaty. And to acknowledge that I'm speaking from unceded lands is to recognize really the illegitimate nature of crown sovereignty from which all other private ownership rights flow. And now I will share my screen. Okay, so I hope all that's fine. So it's this intertwining of sovereignty and private property ownership that I wish to focus on in this lecture. I will argue that the doctrine of preemption, which was the primary means of appropriating and settling indigenous land in British Columbia, as well as much of the United States, has multiple lineages 
two of which are relevant here. One is rooted in 18th century international law or jus gentium that governed relations between European colonial powers. And the other takes the form of domesticated land law doctrine. Both of these lineages points to a form of continued warfare that is being waged by the colonial state and corporations on indigenous peoples. This is also a war being waged on the environment, on the land, on water, on the forests against our future in some ways. This warfare central to ongoing forms of primitive accumulation, of accumulation by dispossession, works by exploiting the ostensible division between public and private power, and by making a series of continual reversals across the supposed public-private divide. Now, the idea that property as a general phenomenon is central to ongoing form processes of primitive accumulation is obviously not controversial. But what I want to explore here is how it is not simply private ownership per se, with its right to exclude, to exploit, and to control, that is the problem. It is through the serial reversals that property enacts, rendering particular groups of people and their actions illegal, and through its alchemy, the violence of others legal, determining the parameters of acceptable political speech and action. It is in the way that property logics transmute assertions of indigenous jurisdiction into private law wrongs that reveals it as a primary apparatus in the ongoing warfare of colonial capitalist accumulation. Now the language of preemption itself signals the logic of war. The preemptive strike doctrine in contemporary international law enables a nation state to take military action against another sovereign entity that has made a threat against it. The idea is to preempt that threat from materializing. The logic of preemption relies on the close entanglement of sovereign authority and the power of property from the early appropriation of indigenous land in North America to the contemporary use of private law remedies, such as the injunction to criminalize assertions of indigenous jur jurisdiction and to criminalize resistance against ecocide and, 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 and to criminalize other forms of protest. This entanglement is evident in the close alignment of interests between the state and the figure of the petty sovereign. In their ongoing struggle to defend their traditional lands, I'm just going to, Ah, uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Okay, in their ongoing struggle to defend their traditional lands, the Gidim Ten clan of the Wet'suwet'en people in Northern British Columbia, right of their preemptive strategy of blocking roads and evicting coastal gas link workers. The Gidim Ten blockade is part of a larger struggle being waged by members of the Wet'suwet'en nation now for over a decade against the construction of the coastal gas link pipeline through their traditional territory. As they state on their website, and I quote, rather than passively waiting for violent militarized police to invade, Gidim 10 checkpoint at Coyote Camp took direct action. We held complete control over the territory from November 14th, the 50th day of reoccupation until the RCMP raid started four days later on November 18th, 2021. And some of you uh, may have witnessed uh, on November 18th because it was widely broadcasted, uh, the violent removal of Molly Wickham from the Coyote camp by a heavily militarized Royal Canadian Mounted Police Force. Molly was arrested along with 14 other land defenders. The pipeline project, which will, upon its completion, 
be 670 kilometers in length and will carry anywhere from 2.1 to 5 billion cubic tons of fracked gas per day from Dawson Creek in Northern British Columbia to the LNG plant in the port city of Kitimat, BC is the uh, project that is being contested here. Coastal GasLink is a British Columbia based subsidiary of TC Energy. TC Energy operates 92,600 kilometers of, net, of uh, a network of pipelines through North America and Mexico. The LNG project has a total investment of $40 billion and its shareholders include subsidiaries of Royal Dutch Shell, Petronas, PetroChina, Mitsubishi Corp, and Korea Gas Corporation. The Wet'suwet'en Nation was one of the parties to the first case in Canadian history to recognize the right to Aboriginal title enshrined in Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. The case, first tried in, British, in the British Columbia Supreme Court, wound its way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, who overturned the lower court judgments to find that the Aboriginal title of the Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan people had never been extinguished. The case was brought by hereditary chiefs of both of these nations, and they claimed 58,000 square miles of their traditional territories. Now, while the Supreme Court of Canada defined for the first time, and that judgment came down from the court in 1997. So at that point, the Supreme Court of Canada defined for the first time what constitutes Aboriginal title. So they fleshed it out and gave it uh, its legal definition. They also set out what justifies its limitations. But it also sent the issue of whether the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en actually held Aboriginal title to their land back to the table to be settled either through negotiation or even a new trial, neither of which have happened. And they did that really on the basis of a technicality, a stunning sleight of hand, as John Burroughs has written, given the case took decades to mount and millions of dollars in legal fees and was the result of a multi-generational struggle waged by indigenous peoples. Now, the Supreme Court of Canada's uh, judgment is, is well known um, amongst people who study um, indigenous rights uh, for overturning the racist narrative of the trial judge who in dismissing the claim for title outright concluded that the lives of indigenous peoples prior to contact with Europeans had been nasty, brutish, and short, invoking the Hobbesian specter of the state of nature. But as a student reminded me the other day, this judgment still forms part of the colonial archive. And more than that, when we examine the, interlocut the interlocutory injunction uh, that gave the RCMP the right to evict um, Molly Wickham and the land defenders at the behest of the Coastal GasLink Corporation, we might well ask whether the prevailing mentality of the Canadian state continually casts Indigenous land defenders as if they exist in some kind of pre-legal, if not illegal state, uh, when they assert jurisdiction over their lands without the permission of the state. The BC Supreme Court judgment of Justice McEachern tells the story of preemption as the basis upon which the Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan lands were appropriated and is key to that, uh, and it is to that key doctrine that I now turn. So I'm now going to get into the history of preemption. In 1860, uh, Governor James Douglas, the first premier of the newly constituted province of British Columbia, proclaimed that unsurveyed land in British Columbia would be open for preemption. With pressure on him to populate the province with settlers who could grow food and contribute both to the creation of various markets and also a revenue base for the burgeoning colony, uh, 
Douglas needed a fast way to attract white settlers of good character to British Columbia. And um, unlike in other parts of Canada, uh, only a handful of treaties were signed with Indigenous nations, all of them on Vancouver Island, for those of you who are familiar with the um, geography of this place. Um, and even those treaties are now under um, uh, a lot of scrutiny due to the unclear, unfair, and in some cases unconscionable conditions under which they were concluded. The lands that Douglas opened up for preemption in the rest of this vast province were unsurveyed. Surveying was cumbersome, expensive, and took a really long time. Who would bear the cost of surveying and mapping the land? The British government had refused to provide funding or financial assistance for the cost of settling this land. And by opening up the land for preemption, Douglas effectively deferred the cost of surveying to a future moment, allowing individual settlers to claim up to 160 acres each on the promise that with evidence of improvement, uh, i.e. cultivation within a couple of years, they could then uh, after two years uh, obtain title to that land. The labor of clearing and cultivating the land would fall on the indiv individual settler. And ostensibly by mixing his labor with the land, the settler could gain a right of private ownership over it. The boundaries of the preempted land were thus uncertain because the land was unsurveyed and relied on the preemptor to draw the boundaries to the best of his ability on a record of preemption. Now, neither Indian reserves nor Indian settlements are mentioned in the initial proclamation of 1860. As the reality of violent dispossession and indigenous complaint at the usurpation of their lands by settlers became an issue for Governor Douglas and the coterie of magistrates scattered throughout the province, it became necessary to make provision in the 1861 Preemption Consolidation Act to deal with this problem. The act provided that all male British subjects over 18 years of age could preempt waste crown land, accepting Indian reserves or settlement. However, and this is a crucial point, as many historians have pointed out, the term Indian settlement was never defined. James Douglas essentially borrowed or imported the doctrine of preemption from the United States, where, as Robert Nichols notes, the principle of preemption was recognized by the Continental Congress after the US gained independence and reformulated to apply to settlers on the Western frontier. I'm quoting there. In the United States, preemption was widely used as a means of retroactively legalizing the action of squatters. And this is part of what Robert Nichols in his wonderful book argues as, is the recursive nature of how property is constituting, constituted. Inverting Proudhon's famous phrase, Robert Nichols has persuasively argued that acts of dispossession are what recursively constitute relations that are recognized as property interests in the same moment as the property rights of indigenous people are extinguished. Preemption operated in precisely this way in the American context, giving squatters the right of first refusal over land they had occupied illegally. Now, the doctrine of preemption as a means of creating markets and land has no common law precedent. As Robert Nichols writes, and here I quote, which is on the slide, preemption, the technique by which so much unceded indigenous land was appropriated has its origins in the colonial period where a right claimed by one European power against others to first occupancy assigned a special status to the original discoverer of a new territory. The way in which preemption is used to claim colonial territory 
speaks volumes about how modern property laws in some important ways originate as a form of warfare. Doctrines of discovery and conquest were rooted in the logics of property, both in the realm of abstract philosophical justifications for on the ground. You do this through a logic of landed property. As Alan Greer writes, what distinguished American imperialism from other grounds European claims to territorial authority was the way its spatial claims were expressed mainly through reference to vendable property, vendable landed property. The United States made its case in terms of the legal concept of preemption, a key word that came to the fore just at the time of the revolution. It was a term that applied to, prop that applied to property right at a number of different levels. But in the current context, preemption designated the national government's exclusive right to acquire land from natives. In formulating territorial sovereignty over the West, primarily as a real estate uh, monopsony, the Americans were taking to a kind of logical extreme, a tendency that had emerged in the 18th century British colonial practice. To a remarkable degree, they attempted to reduce the complex processes of colonization and imperial expansion to a matter of land purchasing. It is in the early modern period, however, that the conflation and interchangeability between royal prerogative powers of the sovereign on the one hand and the common law on the other emerges. As Marty Kos Koskiniemi has noted, and I quote, the pluralism of the English legal system ensured that the relations of Englishmen to the outside world would be covered by two kinds of law of nations one administered by civil lawyers within the changing confines of the royal prerogative, and another operated by both civil and common lawyers, common law lawyers, having to do with the expansion of English private and public interests across the world. So Koskinyemi traces the early modern contestations between civil lawyers who understood the use gentium as an emanation of Royal Roman imperial ideas that involved an expansive concept of the royal prerogative or the power of the sovereign and common law jurisprudence who argued for the application of common law principles to the matters that were connected to the lives of Englishmen and their individual rights to property, whether at home or abroad and remember in this early modern period, thinking about the 17th century, um, that the right to property and the right to trade are understood as natural rights uh, uh, of every um, Englishman. Now, we might, we might now see as a conflation, what, what we might now see as a conflation of the public and the private is more the result of an originary co-mingling of sovereign power in the form of the royal prerogative and laws of private property, which were held to be sacred and inviolable. The powerful idea that the reason and rationality underlying the common law made it universally applicable and central to the notion of a rule of law guaranteed its use and deployment throughout the colonial world. In the international sphere, one occupying and with an intent to possess, a Europe once occupying and with an intent to possess, a European state could then preempt a territory, asserting their sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis other nation states. Once it had asserted the right of preemption, the sovereign of that state could give out proprietary grants based on the feudal logic that the sovereign was the ultimate owner of all land in that claimed territory. So the doctrine of preemption existed in England as a royal prerogative power, enabling the king to seize household goods at his pleasure. But of course that diminishes along with the great transformation and the long durée of the enclosure movement. Preemption then becomes codified in law 
via acts of parliament in the 19th century, when the state needed to preempt land for the purposes of railway building and other infrastructural projects in England. In terms of the common law uh, in the UK, the right of preemption is a contractual and personal right solely within the purchaser's control to compel a transfer of the, of the vendor's land at some future date. The grantee of a right of preemption is clearly not entitled in the first instance to compel any transfer of a legal estate. Significantly, while attracting much criticism over the years, the right of preemption in the UK was never recognized as a proprietary uh, interest um, until the Land Registration Act of 2002, but not so in the colonies where the right of preemption was slowly through various bits of mundane and quotidian case law given the weight of a proprietary interest. And this is really important, uh, although it sounds like mundane sort of land law stuff. Um, we, we can think about how right up to the current moment, we can think about the kind of Brexit nationalism pervasive in the UK, that a key aspect of English nationalism has always been the belief that the English common law system and the rule of law are the pinnacle of civilized life and society. It is their gift to the world. And that English legal consciousness is really what gave birth to this system. Um, and when we study modern laws of property, uh, we actually see how much legal innovation, we could call it, actually unfolded in the colonies um, as a result of the encounter with other legal systems, ontologies and political formations. So the laws of preemption as they have developed in the settler colony were not derived from the common law of England. Um, embedded in proclamations, they were a creature of statutes that had as their primary purpose to create proprietary interests in land similar to the way in which title by registration developed in the colony prior to wide scale adoption in the United Kingdom. Uh, the doctrine of preemption as a means of establishing a market in land evolves not in the UK, but in the settler colony. The origins of preemption as it evolves in the colony lie both in international legal doctrine that governed colonial land acquisition and the feudal logic um, of property that gave the sovereign a power of radical or underlying ownership. Now, as mentioned a moment ago, sorry, I'm gonna get to this slide about Israel in a moment, but maybe I will just, um, because it's a bit odd to be staring at that <laughs> while I speak about other things. As mentioned a moment ago, um, the right to preempt in law is essentially a right of first refusal. Uh, preemption gave white settlers the right of first refusal over land to which they had no legitimate claim. The right of preemption or the right of first refusal assumes a relationship between the person asserting the right and the original owner of the land. So in the, in the context of uh, property law, you know, um, a right to preempt is, is uh, you know, in, in mundane terms where someone who owns property gives that right of first refusal to someone, uh, usually based on some kind of prior relationship, either commercial or personal. Now, whilst some early colonial governors such as James Douglas may have readily seen through the Lockean fantasy of the uncultivated wasteland, recognizing what was then referred to in the 19th century as Indian title. Preemption operated in a recursive manner, following Robert Nichols here, to constitute colonial sovereignty through giving settlers a right of first refusal. Preemption, to paraphrase the words of the majority judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Delgamo case, which I referred to earlier, retroactively put the legitimacy of colonial crown sovereignty beyond any doubt. Now, fusing together 
the sovereign power of the colonial authorities with the property logics of private ownership. Preemption was a doctrine that enabled settlers to undertake the work of settlement, both for individual gain and also for the formation of the settler state. It is clear that the power of the colonial sovereign to control land and make territory has always relied upon the force of the individual petty sovereign who with the backing and blessing of the state makes land waste in order to appropriate it. While the laws pertaining to preemption specify that Indian settlements or villages were not to be preempted, in recognition of Indian title, an Indian settlement, as I mentioned earlier, was never defined in these statutes. And the historical record is replete with testimony from First Nations elders that evidenced how settlers would often make settled indigenous lands into waste, thereby rendering it available for preemption. The McKenna McBride Royal Commission, which was established in 1912, to resolve the quote unquote Indian question in British Columbia reveals routine violence by settlers who are treated with practical impunity. Indigenous elders from all over the province attested to this Royal Commission about how their houses, their villages and settlements were routinely destroyed, their access to fishing, wood and other resources prohibited by settlers. And this part of the research um, is, is being done in conjunction with a group of scholars. Uh, so I just wanted to, to note that. Um, this is just one small part of that research project which focuses on, on the law of preemption. Now specifically testimony about the, the burning of indigenous people's homes, the clearing and appropriation of reserve lands for the purpose of settlement and the creation of infrastructure, including roads and railways, the cutting down of trees and theft of other resources, all point to forms of violence used to make lands that were clearly occupied, possessed, and cultivated by Indigenous peoples into a kind of wasteland and therefore open for appropriation. Drawing again on Nichols' argument, the violence of settlers in turning settled Indigenous lands into waste retroactively makes it available to be turned into settler property. The testimonies of Indigenous elders in the McKenna McBride Commission uh, records also convey routine settler violence on lands reserved for Indians, the cutting down of trees, the extraction of resources, the use of those lands as grazing pastures for cattle, the appropriation and occupation of traditional fishing spots, really anything that promoted the settlement and economic development of the province. And what this makes clear is that even on the terms of preemption, the settlement of the province required extra legal violence. Here I'm also drawing on the work of Nicholas Blomley. And the fact that these acts were most often met with impunity reflects the state support for these petty sovereigns who created markets and land based on a kind of metaphysical and racial kinship with colonial sovereign power. So the state may have the monopoly of violence, but the police force are not its only agents of enforcement. In fact, we can consider how the settler colonial state depends on the instrumentalization of this blurred monopoly by the petty sovereign settler population. Um, with Israel being a prime example of how this operates. And here I have the, the um, video that was taken less than a year ago, last May, uh, when all of the attempted evictions of uh, Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah was, was happening um, with the, the quite, you know, what's captured on the video is quite stunning, uh, where uh, Munna Al-Kurd says to the settler, uh, Jacob, why are you taking my house? And he replies, look, if I don't take it, someone else will. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite something to have captured uh, on, on, um, on, on the video. So now um, a right of preemption, as I mentioned 
previously gives the preemptor a right of first refusal over land by the current owner. And it does not preclude the notion that there are other parties who may well have an interest in that same property. In the colonial context, the sovereign asserts radical ownership over indigenous lands and by proclamation gives the right of first refusal to white settlers. Indigenous title to land or Indian title as it was referred to in the 18th and 19th centuries is acknowledged, but at the same time disavowed. With the development of the judicial doctrine of Aboriginal title and contemporary recognition politics, this disavowal continues and sets the scene for perpetual frontier violence that we see happening uh, all over this country and others um, in, in different forms. So now to work towards the conclusion of the paper, I'm going to turn towards um, injunctions and I want to return to the scene of the expulsion of the um, uh, land of the Wet'suwet'en land defenders. So returning to the contemporary moment, and I apologize to any historians who are listening for constantly jumping between centuries, um, but uh, returning to the contemporary moment, we can examine the interlocutory injunction granted by Madam Justice Church to Coastal Gaslink in December 2019. In this judgment, we see how the juridical entanglement uh, of sovereign authority and the power of property frames the actions of the Wet'suwet'en land defenders as illegal and renders their lands up for grabs by the petty sovereign, in this case, a corporation who has the backing of the state in the forms of regulatory permits to construct the pipeline. Now, let's remember that an injunction is essentially a private law remedy. Describing what she terms as BC's, British Columbia's injunction habit, legal scholar Irina Cherik has explored the way in which the private public nexus enacts colonial violence through the use of injunctions to criminalize indigenous resistance against extractivism. And of course, the injunction is used all over the place to criminalize uh, protests. We can see how that's happened recently again um, in, uh, at the University of London with the SOAS student occupation. Um, in any case, returning to this site, um, Irina has explored um, how the um, uh, use of the private law remedy is, is used constantly to criminalize indigenous resistance against extractivism in particular. And it is here that we can see the mutually constituent foundations of liberal legal orders, sovereign power and private property coalesce in the law's ability to suspend Wet'suwet'en land rights and rendal, render coastal gas link as the victim of illegal actions. The resistance to coastal gas link, uh, as the judge notes, it, uh, is complex uh, because a number of First Nations band councils, which were originally a governance structure invented by the colonial state in the late 19th century, have signed benefit sharing agreements with coastal gas link. They have agreed and given permission for the pipeline to run through their reserve lands. The hereditary chiefs, however, have not. And these divisions within the Wet'suwet'en Nation, arguably the result, well, more than arguably, uh, the result of colonialism itself, are used as a basis to reject the arguments of the defendant land defenders and specifically their claim that they were acting according to what Stoughton law. The absence of recognition of indigenous laws by the state through, and I quote, the incorporation into treaties court declarations such as Aboriginal title or rights jurisprudence or statutory provisions, end quote, means that the actions of the land defenders 
are rendered illegal. Um, here we have a quote from the um, uh, injunction judgment, uh, which states there has been no process by which the Wet'suwet'en customary laws have been recognized in this manner. The Aboriginal title claims of the Wet'suwet'en people have yet to be resolved either by negotiation or litigation, as I had mentioned earlier. While Wet'suwet'en customary laws clearly exist on their own independent footing, they are not recognized as being an effectual part of Canadian law. So the Supreme Court of Canada's determination in that Delgamo judgment of 1997 that the actual question of whether the Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan nations had Aboriginal title to their lands um, and the fact that they, they decided that that was to be retried or settled through negotiation comes right back to haunt the present actions of the land defenders. And while the perils of liberal recognition politics are no surprise here, it is the work that this non-recognition does beyond the reiteration of colonial sovereignty that is important. The non-recognition of Wet'suwet'en jurisdiction over the areas that are being blockaded means that the actions can only be illegal and more than that, can only be comprehended ultimately in terms of a property dispute. The, the blockade is framed as a self-help remedy. I'm just going to get to the next slide. So um, now the self-help remedy is not in the terms we would colloquially understand them, but is rather a legal term. A self-help remedy in law is where an individual asserts their rights without resorting to a higher legal authority or using a writ, which is a cause of action, to enforce their right. So an example would be where a landlord relies on his common law right to evict a tenant for non-payment of rent without bothering to get an eviction order or using a bailiff. And when um, someone relies on this self-help remedy and doesn't violate the peace or breach the law in any other way, they're, they're generally um, uh, condoned. But where, they, uh, where a self-help remedy does violate the peace or breach the law, they are not condoned in any way in, in Canadian law. And the judge concludes, therefore, that the blockades of bridges and roads the permit violations of provincial forestry regulations and other laws are not a recognized means of dealing with uh, breaches of Wet'suwet'en law. Instead, the actions of the land defenders are reduced to the tort of nuisance law, cast as an interference with an occupier's use and enjoyment of land or property that is both uh, substantial and unreasonable. Um, so the, the judge notes the defendants chose not to engage in consultation with the plaintiff or to challenge the validity of the permits and authorizations granted to Coastal GasLink at the time they were uh, granted. Instead, the defendants chose to resort to self-help remedies. There is no evidence before me of any Indigenous law which authorizes blockades or roads or bridges to deal with a breach of what's so it's in law. So it's, you know, um, having played out the, the perils of liberal recognition politics, what is clearly an assertion of Wet'suwet'en jurisdiction uh, is then instead rendered in terms of a, a, uh, an act of nuisance. Private nuisance is the interference with an occupier's use and enjoyment of land or property. And this is very important. That is both substantial and unreasonable. The occupier, so in this case, uh, coastal gas link need not hold title to the land or have exclusive possession in order to advance a claim for nuisance. Um, so to conclude, um, liberal legal foundations that ostensibly separate the public sphere of sovereign authority from the private sphere of property relations work to obscure the ways in which um, that sovereign authority and property logics operate conjointly as they always have. Um, as Eric 
Aliez and Maurizio Lazzarotto argue in War and Capital, from the beginning, liberalism has been a philosophy of total war. And much like the histories of preemption, the sovereign colonial power of the state reduces challenges to its authority to a property dispute. Assertions of indigenous jurisdiction that challenge the underlying title of the sovereign are rendered as a wrong committed against the petty sovereign who in the frame of a colonial political imaginary maintains a racial kinship with sovereign power. And I end with that, uh, an image that in my mind encapsulates that relationship quite uh, clearly. So thank you and I, I will stop there. Thanks so much, Brenna, for a really fascinating talk. Um, I'm sure people have a lot of questions and we've got some time now if anyone wants to use the Q&A box. Uh, please feel free to enter your questions and I'll put them to uh, Brenna for some discussion. Uh, maybe to start things off, we could just make a couple of comments and questions in response uh, to get the discussion sure. going. Um, the first question I'd like to ask is about um, the sort of the relationship between preemption and the temporalities of colonialism. Um, because something that was really interesting in what you highlighted about preemption um, is its structure of retroactively justifying power. Um, it's kind of a recursive structure, if you like. Um, and as you kind of described that, it just kind of, you know, made the connection for me with kind of settler colonialism more broadly, which is defined or characterized by this really peculiar sort of clash of temporalities of, on the one hand, the sort of new post-enlightenment kind of racism. Uh, that's justified with reference to progress and civilization, but is practiced via this kind of obscure pre-modern fantasy of agrarian communities, uh, settler communities. Um, so I don't really have a concrete question, but I just thought it might be interesting to tease out some of that relationship of kind of the, the discordance of temporalities that takes place in preemption uh, uh, laws and settler colonial kind of yeah, temporalities. And I think that's really sort of accentuated today when you look at these sorts of places like, um, you know, some of the examples you gave from, from Israel and beyond. Um, and then secondly, uh, kind of a question about the language of uh, warfare. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you started by noting how um, when thinking about property, we have to go beyond questions of just private ownership. Um, that's about, you know, property as a, a social form uh, that mediates all sorts of alchemies. Um, and I was struck by, like, in the talk, when you described specific examples, you know, the Wet'suwet'en community or Israel-Palestine, there are instances of naked violence, you know, it's unambiguous warfare, or kind of expulsion, etc., colonial violence and so on. Um, but at the same time, the way sort of the violence of property works today, it's often a bit more diffuse or nefarious. Um, if you think about maybe how people of colour or other sort of non-Indigenous peoples are racialized in different sorts of, you know, forms of, uh, let's say, differential inclusion, where they're invited sometimes to identify with certain forms of ownership, you know, the idea of uh, class composition taking place by you know, entrepreneurship or even sorts of how the, the sinister way the housing market works for, for Black Americans um, and beyond. Um, so in that context, I wanted to ask a question about whether warfare, you know, what you think about that, uh, the language of warfare when thinking about racialization and how capitalist property relationships work more broadly today, is the language of warfare better suited to thinking about Indigenous, uh, the violence Indigenous communities uh, suffer and sort of surplus populations, or um, to what extent it's generalizable towards these more diffuse um, or complex uh, relations today, if, if that makes sense. Um, okay, I'll stop there and okay. thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna start with that question because the, the other part, the first part of your comment on temporality is, uh, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said about that. But in terms of the language of warfare, I mean, I think this is something that is obviously not completely, is not worked out very much in the paper yet, but I think that when, I, when I'm using the language of warfare, I'm thinking about it in terms of um, how that, how, how the language of warfare, 
is helpful in understanding the violence of ongoing processes of primitive accumulation or accumulation by dispossession. And I think that, you know, insofar as that language of warfare helps us understand the articulation of um, many forms of violence that, as you're saying, in terms of the quotidian way in which property operates, doesn't have the same kind of spectacular appearance, right, as the eviction of the land defenders does, or, you know, um, I, I still think that the language is really useful. And the example that I would use um, is to think about how neoliberalism and financialization operate in the realm of housing. So taking a different, a complete, like quite a different um, context, even though we could say that the corporate interests, of course, span all of these different uh, contexts, right? Um, but when we look at, you know, the way in which neoliberal rationality saturates um, everyday life, particularly in the context of housing, and then even more so in the context of social housing, and we see how, um, you know, um, how, how unlivable life is, I think, is one way to kind of uh, sum it up. Um, I, I think that the language of warfare, when it comes to contemporary forms of capitalist accumulation in relationship to diverse spheres of property, including housing, is, is something that I think has, has a lot of analytical value in it. Um, and I could, I could talk more about a particular case. I mean, we can look at the Grenfell Tower fire as a case where, you know, the conditions under which um, um, that fire happened and this massive loss of life in the middle of the city of London, you know, that is, uh, I could sort of unpack it much more, but it's a really good example of where the violence of what, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and others have termed organized abandonment, you know, um, when we, we look at the kind of violence of that sort of rationality, that rationality of, of governance, um, what it produces, I think the language of warfare is, is, is appropriate. But I, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to say about racialization and, ne and neoliberalism as well, and how racism and neoliberalism um, are articulated through one another, because I think it is quite different than older liberal forms of racism. Thanks so much. I don't know if you wanted to respond to my first point or if we should go to other questions. So. Uh, temporality. Um, yeah, I think that that is also, I think the way temporality is operating in terms of the injunction judgment to take that kind of concrete case is really complicated um, because, you know, you have all kinds of suspensions of time operating here. So the Supreme Court of Canada sends the um, issue of whether the Wet'suwet'en and Gitsun actually have Aboriginal title back to the negotiating table or say, you need to relitigate this. And they do that on the basis of a real technicality that there was a default in the plea, in the legal pleadings, which is just sort of, you know, I, I'm not sure what to what words to use anyway. Um, and so that question of ownership is suspended while the assertion of indigenous jurisdiction is now ongoing. So you have the, the question of ownership sort of left hanging in a way. What is not left hanging is the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada did recognize that the land is unseated, right? So, you know, we, we could understand how that recognition itself uh, opens up the possibilities of, of the assertion of indigenous uh, jurisdiction, but, but the suspension of that question legally, it allows the court 
to reduce the actions of the Wet'suwet'en land defenders down to a real estate dispute, essentially, or a property dispute, which is, which is very similar to what we were seeing in Palestine. I mean, all of the, the, the um, you know, well, not, I mean, a, a lot of the, dis, the Israeli discourse and even some of the international discourse around the evictions that were happening in, in Sheikh Jarrah last year were, and are still ongoing, obviously, uh, are rendered in forms of a, in the terms of a property dispute. Um, so that, you know, the way in which sovereign authority, uh, sovereign colonial authority, and the logics of private property are completely imbricated with one another from the beginning, I think is, is what we see being played out in a very kind of uh, opportunistic way in these moments. Thanks very much for that. Um, some really interesting questions coming in. So I'll go to a first question from Jeff Gilbert, who writes, um, I don't know if you can see this in the Q&A uh, box, mm -hmm. but yeah. Uh, I learned so much from that talk. Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask you to say more about ways in which other groups than the police expect to enforce unstable legal rights? I'm particularly interested in private security as an extension distortion of the police and an industry which is um, characterized in places I know by very low ages and status. And Jeff adds that perhaps private security has its own relative autonomy, slightly different from that of settler populations, for example. Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I think that the, the delegation of um, police power to private security is so much of what we see in this moment with the deregulation and the privatization of services that were once performed by the state, right? So um, I think that's another, <clears throat> I mean, that's another, you know, it's another example where we might be able to trace back a, a history of, for example, private militias having for a very long time um, undertaken the violent enforcement of, uh, you know, um, state uh, imperatives. So, uh, I, I do think that that's another example of the of what we now see as an erosion of a public private divide. I mean, we've always known it's a fallacy, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I think that sometimes, at least from a legal perspective, we underappreciate the power of that um, that uh, fiction. You know, we underestimate the power of the fiction of a public-private divide. And I think that that then sort of occludes the way in which power is operating. Um, okay, shall I go to the next question? <laughs> Um, shall I read the next question, Brenna? Or... Sure, yeah, sure, sorry. So, uh, Martin O'Shockensee writes, uh, thanks for a really fascinating talk. I think enclosures in England and the Highland clearances in Scotland date from about the 1750s. To what extent do these practices of expropriation travel between metropole and colony? And to what extent are they differentiated according to the populations and lands they are applied to? Yeah, so in the Colonial Lives of Property book, I actually um, look at the, the writings and the, the work of William Petty in Ireland, who from the 17th century um, devised concepts of value that really tied together a conception of value of land with a, a concept of valuing populations. And that that... Um, the forms of measurement he devised were rooted in a kind of racial thinking. And so I, I do think, uh, in my mind, Ireland remains um, an extremely important, um, you know, site to which to go back to, to try and understand the logics of, uh, uh, you know, how race thinking and, and the logics of private property really co-emerge with each other. Um, so that I, I do think that um, these, I'm not, I'm not saying that 
that is some kind of definite originary point, but it it most certainly um, you know is a is a prior moment and a site from which a lot of the kind of thinking that we then see in other colonies uh, derives from. So I think yeah, it's. It's, I'm very interested in looking at how these kinds of colonial techniques of land appropriation, propertization, travel through different places and um, are altered depending on the, the specifics and the specific kinds of resistance that indigenous populations uh, mount. Because you know a lot of the land laws that emerge are being devised in the moment of a colonial authority trying to respond to different forms of indigenous resistance. And I think that, you know, given what the colonial archive looks like, that often is not easily visible. So I think that's an important thing to mention. I found it kind of extraordinary, the extent to which um, Ireland's kind of colonial positioning has been called into question by recent revisionist historiography in Ireland. So I really appreciate your analysis of that in um, Colonial Lives of Property, found it really um, illuminating. Um, okay, so there's one or two more questions coming in. Um, so Pierre Ilner writes, um, thanks for this fascinating talk, Brenna. Uh, you've shown how settler colonial expansion in North America relied on common law for its property accumulation. Um, if this is a structural feature of settler colonialism, does the same also apply to Latin America or similar cases that didn't export common law? And does that change resistance struggles? Mm. Uh, that's a, a great question, but I'm not sure I can answer it. I mean, I think that, um, you know, one way of, of um, mapping some of what's happening in the contemporary moment across jurisdictions does revolve around the liberal politics of recognition, because that is where you see um, some similar processes of, um, you know, state response to indigenous long, you know, very, very long, well entrenched forms of indigenous resistance is that move to then recognize indigenous rights. And I think that the way that that's happening in different uh, Latin American countries, which I really don't know enough about, but I think is quite, is, is, is significantly different. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about the ways in which, um, I'm thinking about what's happening in Chile right now. And I don't know if there's someone in the room who can, um, you know, speak to that um, in a more informed way than I can, but uh, I, I would be reluctant to, to um, just generalize from the history of the common law to other legal systems. And, um, you know, I think, I think that people often do that when they're talking about law. They don't account for the differences between civil law systems and common law systems. And I think that that is a problem because the way that property is conceived of within a common law system versus a civil law system is, is, is quite different. Um, uh, you know, wh where, where we might look to for uh, processes of uh, homogenization of those legal concepts is in laws between uh, nations in the early colonial period, where they had to, like that's, that's one of the lineages of the doctrine of preemption, right? That had to do with how, how was the United States going to assert sovereign authority over territory that Spain and Britain wanted, or how are the Netherlands going to assert uh, sovereignty over territory in Asia that the Portuguese want? And they, they uh, use the doctrine of preemption actually to um, settle those disputes. So that, that might be a, a, a more historical site where we see how certain concepts become uh, sort of transnational, I guess. Okay, uh, Stefano writes, um, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, you made a quick reference to 17th century natural law as a justification for the process of expropriating the lands of native peoples. I would like to know whether 
and in case to what extent the Lockean notion of property as appropriateness as the capacity to be one's own master played a role in the production of the rights of preemption. Yeah, look, I think, and that's sort of where I, I that's as, as far as I go in the Colonial Lives of Property book. Right, the idea is that you, you are, you, you know, the preemption laws allow settlers to go, go and literally put stakes in the ground um, on unsurveyed land and um, record their preemption on a document. And then on the condition that they improve the land, i.e. cultivate it, build structures on it, etc., et their right of first, their right to exercise that, that, that right of first refusal, the right to gain title to that land depends on that improvement. So it's, very, it's a very clear Lockean rationale. Uh, what I'm trying to do um, with uh, this research group, um, you know, which includes Nick, he was on the call, I think, and others, is to actually look at how, um, you know, it, it wasn't just that settlers and, uh, and colonizers didn't recognize indigenous settlement and indigenous forms of cultivation. I mean, certainly that's true at the high level of philosophy and philosophical rationales for the appropriation of indigenous lands. But when we try and dig into the historical record, what we see are settlers making land into quote unquote waste, like they are, you know, depopulating it um, in order to then appropriated on the on the basis of a Lockean justification. Um, so I think that this gets us much more into the territory of the kind of disavowal that was necessary for that Lockean uh, rationale to be played out. I mean, I think there's a huge amount of, uh, um, uh, yeah, sort of um, disavowal and refusal on the part of, of um, settlers. Okay, I think we've almost run out of questions, but there's one in the chat from um, Lillian, who says, thanks for a really fascinating talk. Uh, I'm not sure if this is entirely relevant, but how do you see uh, the information war on this topic? How do you see those struggles play out in the information war and how it's won or lost? And uh, I wonder if I can take kind of um, moderator's privilege to kind of tag on to that and just ask a more general question, which is, um, you know, when referring to the language of warfare and just a brief reference to Aliez and Lazzarato at the end, um, just more broadly, how useful you find not just the language of warfare, but their analysis of, of war and capital um, for thinking about, um, yeah, for kind of analyzing crisis today. Yeah, I mean, I find the language very useful, which is why I'm trying to, to work with it. I think that, um, you know, when we when we look at the the conditions under which um, people are being asked to survive, particularly now as we enter the third year of a pandemic, um, you know, I think the, the 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 language of warfare is is apt. I mean, the language of warfare to uh, uh, to describe contemporary processes of primitive accumulation or accumulation by dispossession uh, are, are useful. And these wars are being waged, of course, uh, on the basis of multiple forms of exclusion that are also historically embedded. So the question that came up before about what distinguishes indigenous struggles from the struggles of other racialized peoples in other uh, contexts vis-a-vis um, -vis property relations is a, I think a really um, productive, you know, line of questioning because we can, you know, we can see the way contemporary forms of um, accumulation by dispossession in the in the realm, as I mentioned before, of uh, quotidian property relations. Let's say in, in urban environments, operate in the settler colonial context to, you know, offer up to racialized peoples the 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 uh, kind of uh, 
the lie of inclusion, right? I mean, in you know, in, in a way, property ownership is one of the biggest cons of, of the modern era in the sense that, you know, the, the law is that inclusion within its uh, framework is going to lead to some kind of um, uh, freedom or prosperity or, or et cetera. So, so um, I'm, I'm kind of getting off, I'm kind of going on a bit of a tangent, but um, I think the language of warfare comes up also in terms of that, that last um, image that I showed of the freedom convoy in the Canadian context. You know, we see how, um, we see where that language is deployed by the state in relationship to, you know, Indigenous land defenders. It's, it's deployed and it's, it's manifest in this highly militarized response to land defenders, whereas you know, with the Freedom Convoy, and I wanted to pick up on that, the point about this kind of metaphysical and kind of racial kinship, you know, those protesters uh, were spoken about by um, the mayor of Ottawa, by other um, people in positions of state and government. Um, uh, they were treated by many in the police force as kin, you know, as, as uh, in a, in a very different way than um, you know other uh, um, uh, protesters have historically been treated, not just indigenous peoples, but also people protesting extractivism um, and uh, um, climate change, for example. So um, yeah, I might just uh, uh, leave it there for now. Thanks. Um... Did you mean leave it there in relation to that question or overall? Because we've got two more questions if you've got time. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay, so Ian says, uh, thank you, Brenna, and greetings from Olon Territory on San Francisco Bay. My question is, how does the principle of adverse possession fit with your analysis? Um, and then maybe I'll just give you the second one as well if you want to take sure. both. Um, and Jeff um, says, uh, this is really trivial and probably ignorance, but uh, how is the idea of occupation codified, um, as in your slide where you quote uh, a judgment that coastal gas link had rights because they were occupying the land? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think it's actually trivial at all, but to go with the to go with Ian's question, um, you know, I think adverse possession, like prescription, I was thinking initially about preemption as um, something akin to a prescriptive right or adverse possession. And of course, adverse possession and prescription have a prescription being, um, you know, gaining a property right through long use, right? Um, but, but prescription and adverse possession have this very long history in the in uh, English common law, whereas preemption um, doesn't, <laughs> which is came as a, um, a slight surprise to me. Uh, when I started looking, I had, I had kind of assumed that preemption must originate in an earlier common law doctrine, but actually what we see is preemption really only existing um, in the realm of the royal prerogative and then being a creature of statute in, in England. And so when the state, um, you know, in, in, in more um, recent times, like from the 19th century onwards, uh, you know, requires land to build infrastructure during the Industrial Revolution, et cetera, and later, um, that's when um, pre preemption is used. But it doesn't actually have a history, really, in the common law as a proprietary interest. You know, it exists as a kind of contractual interest, um, but not, not really as a proprietary interest. And I, I'm, I, I'm still working through this, but my hunch is that it's in the settler colony that you see through case law um, preemption coming to have the quality of a property interest. Uh, and, and, and the reason why that's so important is because we see how property laws are, um, you know, uh, changed. There's kind of legal innovation. Uh, in order to promote settlement, 
you know, so even where it doesn't have a life in the common law in England in the same way, it's used in the context of the settler colony as the most efficient way of denying indigenous uh, rights over their land. So um, that's how I would see it being quite different from adverse possession. Um, and in terms of the, of the other question about um, occupation, uh, yeah, I found that quite extraordinary in the injunction judgment, you know, that in order that, that after, after finding that what Soetan law is um, not really in play, uh, after making the comment, which I find um, strange that blockades of bridges, et cetera, are not um, actions that are grounded in Wet'suwet'en law, even though they're quite clearly an assertion of Wet'suwet'en jurisdiction over their lands. Um, after finding all of those, uh, after making all of those moves, uh, the judge is then allowed to place Coastal Gaslink as the bringers of the, you know, they're, they're the ones asking for the injunction. Um, they, they take the place of the wronged party and it's interesting that they are described as, as, an, as, as a party who can bring the injunction even though they're not in exclusive possession of the land because of course they're not. Um, they have regulatory permits allowing them to construct the pipeline. So, um, you know, I think that that's quite an, um, you know, an important move that the judge makes in order to render the land defenders essentially, uh, um, you know, as illegal trespassers on their land. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, thanks very much again, Brenna and everyone watching. Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks a lot.